Welcome to the Penguin Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Tate. Joining me as always, my good buddy, Nick Lacapo. Nick, how you doing? Yes, we're back. <laughs> this is, uh, it's nice doing this every week. I think so. And, uh, yeah. and, and now they're ended up on YouTube too, which is fun. Mm. So, and uh, do we have less listeners now that we talk more or do we have more? I'll, or, I'll have to check this. Or nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've gotten some pretty interesting, like, People going like, hey, is the uh, Desert Island Magic books or the top five under five or the Everyday Carry going away? No, they're coming back. They're just, we're just changing things up. Um, a lot of people are digging the new format and also wanting to make sure that we talk about other stuff. But uh, oh, they're like, we don't want to replace Desert Island Magic books with me. Is that what it is? They're, they're worried they're, they're, that, that I am the island. Do they love having you on? They just, they <laughs> want their, they want all of the content is, is what I'm hearing. Got it. So, got it. Uh, we have, uh, we had some cool stuff come out. Um, Fantasy is the one that came out, I think, after we talked last week. Uh, that I'm, I'm yes, so I believe excited. it did. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We were, um, we love our Paul Wilson, as well documented on this, uh, yeah. on this pod, particular podcast. Our Paul came out last year, last, last, um, yeah. early last year. Man, it was yeah. a while ago, 2023, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, <laughs> and we filmed a bunch of projects. How many have come out just? just is this the first one i think this is the first one because yeah there's there's a cool monty trick and a really cool transposition trick that are going to be coming out uh in a few weeks so maybe we can talk uh, we can like sort of hint at those a little bit but let's yeah fantasy is the exciting one because this was like i'll never forget the first time i saw this uh did you ever see the movie shade you know what i've never watched it you've never seen shade <laughs> No, I've never seen it. Oh man, maybe we do want another one of those like magician reacts videos, like we did for Magic Camp, but with shades. Is the whole thing magic and gambling, or is it, it's, is it the whole thing? Else? The whole thing is gambling. It's all Got about it. the underground right. LA gambling yeah. scene. Jason England and R. Paul Wilson are in it. Uh, I've seen the opening sequence because, yeah. like, because that's, that's where fantasy is. all freak out a bit. Yeah, fantasy is in the beginning. Is it? It's like in the title card, I think. It is. Yeah, it is the title card. There's a trash poker hand, and then you run your thumb along it, and then it visually changes into a royal flush. Yeah, it's very cool. That's it. It's exactly what that is. I mean, it's it's a one second magic trick. Yeah. Hey, I got a terrible poker hand up, uh, and now I don't. Um, it's I, the best way to do it, you know. Uh, as our really Paul says, he spent a lifetime learning sleight of hand ways to do it, and it's not worth it. <laughs> no, it's, if you could do fantasy, then there's there's no reason to do any of those like complicated card mucks. Uh, and I think what's so I remember buying this originally when he put it out because it was a PDF and you had to make it. But now we're custom making the gaffs and it's uh, shimmed, so you can use it with things like the Raven. Yeah, sure. Which is yeah. Anytime you can use a magnet to clean up, it's a it's a win. There, there's an insane shot in the demo of our Paul Wilson doing the change while wearing a raven, and it is. Oh, is he? I didn't even know that he's using a raven in that. Oh, we 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 hooked him up and and did we it. Hooked him up to a raven. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It Jeez. was it was pretty cool, and it's that's awesome. I mean, for Instagram, like. There's, I can't imagine anything better. No, it's a great B-roll shot. I mean, it's, it, it's killer. It'd be great to just have on, you know, all these situations that people find themselves in these days. Like if you're on Fool Us or the morning news or, I mean, even the last time I did the news, mm -hmm. you know, they want you to do like the in-between spots. Yeah. Like just like coming up, you know, is the magician. <laughs> and it's just great to have anything like that sometimes those are pre-recorded too you know so to have a nice little stash of tricks that you know play visually to the camera like that it's, it's important these yeah. days super important and you know the i think the other the other kind of fun thing about it is that he's you know he's been playing with this for decades now so there's all kinds of like little tips in this like even if you have it in the past getting this updated one is you're going to learn little things that you'd never learn otherwise. Well, that was the, the, the myth of fantasy, right? Like, cause I had, I'd heard of the trick, but 
you know, when the movie came out, it wasn't so much in this internet era when everything is a product and like, <laughs> so when that shot happened, all of the card geeks were kind of speculating on how it was accomplished. Am I, am I wrong? No, that's on that. Or yeah. like, because it looks incredible and you have to assume, cause the movie is about sleight of hand, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, so, but that, that is not a sleight of hand shot. That is a, uh, that's a gimmick shot. Yeah. So I think that it was a really strong moment that, that stood out to everybody. And now you can buy it and, and uh, learn from our Paul. I've seen, seen some early comments about the tutorial saying how enjoyable it is. I haven't watched it yet, but uh, you know, our, our Paul is just one of those guys that's got all the stories at this point and, knows how to teach. Yeah. yeah uh, it's a good one. Pick it up. It's pretty, pretty awesome. And then uh, the other one uh, that came out a little bit ago was Brims is featuring you. <laughs> yeah. Brims. I love Brims. Do I have a, where's my hat? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's not in here. It's a, um, it's a sticker that you put on a baseball cap. Uh, do I? I don't have it. So yeah. like, I don't know how long it was, but like 20 years ago or something, people started just leaving the size sticker that came on the brim of your baseball hat on the baseball hat. Yeah. It was the type of thing, like when I was a kid, my dad would be like, why the hell, do you, why do you still get the sticker <laughs> on your hat? Nowadays, nobody, nobody even sees it or questions it or yeah. whatever. It's just part of what people do. It's like the cool thing to do. So Josh, this was something that came out in the magazine a while ago. Yeah had the nice idea to make a uh, predict a card prediction that just hides in plain sight. So the, the sticker itself, just instead of saying like size, whatever says queen of hearts or mm-hmm. seven of spades or three of clubs or I forget what the other force card is. But mm-hmm. so if you get it, you'll get eight stickers, uh, four silver, four gold, and there are four different force cards uh, for each one. They just slap it on your hat. So if you wear a hat, I mean, just, you should have this because <laughs> you just have a uh, you just have a, a force card ready to go at all times. It's super fun, and you know the routines that you can do with a hat are pretty versatile. You know, like put the hat down, card under hat. It's mm-hmm. like card under box style routines, but with a hat. And you can even do like a final load. You know, uh, with the but yeah. So it's it makes all the sense in the world if you have a hat to just own brims you know but i think it's probably is it on special still like yeah it doesn't matter but it's mm -hmm. cheap enough just pick it up you'll have it for life (laughs) yeah it's like it's definitely one of those things that like having that reveal just handy is like you know you can even if you didn't have a deck of cards on you like you could be like name a card you know and and, you know more often than not people say seven of clubs or queen of hearts or something like that so you can even do some almost almost propolis mentalism uh, style stuff with it which is yeah like in the tutorial i i i go through some routines you can do, but more about, yeah, you want that dream scenario where somebody just names a card and it happens to be it, but just ways to put yourself in that position so that it happens more often. For example, one of the force cards is the queen of hearts. And of course the queen of hearts is a heavily named card, but if you're doing a trick like wave, yeah. um, You know, they have to name a queen and it feels like a freely named queen or freely named card. Cause it, it is. Yeah. But after you perform Wave, you could even throw it in their face a little bit further that you knew what they would choose because it's the the card that's printed on your hat. Um, same with, there's another trick that's coming out in a few weeks called Entourage um, by Gordon Bean, which mm-hmm. you'll have to, well, I'm sure we'll be talking about on here. Oh, yeah. Uh, the ending of that trick allows you to, not only are they naming any queen, mm-hmm. um, so if they name the Queen of Hearts, you know, you do brims. If they don't, you don't do brims. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they name the queen of hearts, uh, entourage puts you in the position to make that queen vanish. Oof. And then like, you can have it in your hat, you know, just a duplicate in the inside of your hat. Mm-hmm. And then you reveal that the sticker also says the queen of hearts. So, uh, it's just, you know, ways to make those scenarios happen more often. And so we, we talk about those things in the instructional video, but you already know what to do with it. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's a card way to reveal a card from your hat. Um, and it's just a, I mean, yeah, if you wear a baseball hat, I this would have been one of my go-to tricks oh, you know, yeah. 20 years ago. I still wear a hat a lot, but um, yeah, uh, believe it or not, I used to shave my head every week. So uh, uh, I had baseball hats a we lot. Gotta, we got to <laughs> dig up some some of those old Nick shaved head photos for uh, mm. for the YouTube video here. Yeah, they're not so bad. They're not so bad. <laughs> uh, and I th- the other thing coming up that uh, we can sort of tease is the Penguin Magic Awards are coming back. That's right. That was uh, 
I was a little concerned that wasn't going to happen this year. Yeah. Um, because yeah, it just things shift and you know, there's a lot of, a lot of reasons. It, it, things change so fast around here, yeah. but anyway, uh, I was kind of, it was nice to see that it was on the schedule and that I have less to do with it, which is great. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so yeah. I think later this week is when the nominations are going to come out and then there's going to be some voting online uh, you just got to stick, uh, stay tuned to our YouTube channel because you'll see, you'll see that drop on YouTube and then be sure to follow us on Instagram for information about voting yeah. and things like that. So it's going to be, it's going to be fun. Friday, right? Yeah. This yeah. Friday, Friday, the, what the hell is this Friday? The 22nd? Yeah. 22nd. Yeah. So that'll 22nd. come out. And then, yeah. uh, I think, um, what I'm the most excited about is that this is the first year we're going to have physical trophies. No, real trophies. Real I've trophies that we can send to people. We t- we, I've we, seen them. We touched them the other day. Yeah, they're in the trunk of my car at the moment because <laughs> we have to take them to this theater and get B-roll shots of them for the uh, for the video, the end, the ending video. So that's yeah. that's fun. Um, yeah, yeah, it's cool. I mean, we don't know who won yet, so I don't know where they're going or anything like that. But because uh, uh, we have to do some voting first. Yeah. So uh, on, to, on to the topic this week, uh, I've got a, a, a young performer on uh, Om Nanji who I met in Blackpool mm. and I was super excited to interview her uh, and she's a member of the Magic Castle Junior program and that sort of dovetailed with you know, a question that I've gotten a lot and I know you've gotten a lot from Penguin fans which are, who were your early influences in Magic? And I know that uh, that's this a, guy right here. Kerm- this is, <laughs> <Kermit> <laughs> <the Frog. laughs> I was not expecting that. Yeah, you weren't expecting Kermit the Frog to uh, show up on today's podcast. Yeah, um, no, it's, look, class. it's it's kind yeah. of an interesting question because both you and I came to Magic kind of late in life. It is. Right. Uh, I, I did. Yeah. I did. I did. So my, you know, I mean, when I. <laughs> The long and short of it is when I when I was a kid, I only knew Copperfield Mm -hmm. and I didn't know that Copperfield did magic that you could like learn and do. I just thought he was like, I I didn't know what I thought it was, you know, and I, you know, honestly, I didn't have any interest in what he did. I thought it was cool to watch, but I wasn't like, oh, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Blaine was the first guy that I saw that, uh, you know, he was doing card tricks in the bar. And at that time I was like 18. Yeah. You know that was starting to become my uh, my my scene, and I was like, "Wait a minute, hold up!" Once I realized he, I mean, he is a demon and he does do real magic, but uh, <laughs> once I realized that, like, maybe maybe there was an alternate way from what he was doing that I could do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, once I realized that, I, I that was that was it, and I. I it was for the sheer reason for like you know adventure, really. Like, yeah, I had these. I knew layman card tricks. Yeah. I did the 21 card trick. I did the biddle trick. Mm-hmm. I did uh, yeah, the, the, the four the robbers slap trick. Yeah. The slap. Yeah. And I did them better than anybody else that knew how to do them yeah. with no, you know, magic training at all. So anyway, yeah. Blaine kind of, Blaine kind of sparked that for me. I didn't know any magicians. I didn't know anything. Mm-hmm. I did somewhere along the line. I probably did every David Blaine trick from that special for five, six years, seven years. That's all I needed. Cause yeah. all I was doing was going to bars and stuff and meeting people and having fun. And yeah. And if, if, if I was that age now, I'd be, you know, the TikTok guy on the beach doing magic tricks to the girls <laughs> in the bathing suits. Like that's what I would be doing. Yeah. Like if, if that was the, that's, that would be me. Um, but when I went to the magic shop for the first time, uh, somebody told me there was one in Boston. It was Hank Lee's. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, Hank Lee's was, was your first shop. That was my, that was my shop. Oh, yeah. Oh man. That's so cool. But it also wasn't my shop. Cause when I first went in there, I, I remember it was like the first magician I ever talked to. Mm-hmm. And I probably thought I knew everything, you know, but he uh, told me to buy some DVDs and I thought they were real like rude to me. And like, I was like, I'm never coming back here again. Magicians suck, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but they did, they, they gave me, or uh, didn't give me, I paid uh, what, $60 for each one of these DVDs. Oh, man. Uh, Michael Lamar, he's in a master Ooh. and uh, Doc Eason, 
bar magic mm -hmm. and bill malone on the loose Just uh, great i spent DVDs. a lot of money in there i yeah no i mean and that was it so like really when you talk inspirations like that's actually where everything came from blaine got me off and running you know yeah. um probably taught me like the wrong way to do magic because i was really probably mimicking him for who knows how long yeah um but i'd never seen anybody like do like a you know those LNL &L videos are funny crafted situations of of uh you know at the time i didn't know they were paid to be there <laughs> i don't know yeah i still don't know i guess it's kind, uh, but, it's kind of hard to realize, like, or to, to remember, like, your first L and L video when you're like mm -hmm. watching those performances. Like, what are you thinking is going on there? Like, it it didn't even occur to me how artificial the situation was when I Same. first watched it. And like now, yeah. I look back and I'm like, this is you. You're never in those situations, right? Like, you no, never, never. But I just I'd never seen that style of magic. It was like, okay, you had the Plain barroom magic and street magic, but then it's the same tricks, arguably better tricks performed in like a, like a formal setting, and they were killing. I mean, yeah, I mean, those reactions on those videos are out of control, as we as uh, as we know. Um, but they're destroying. Oh, well, Doc's video was a little different because he was behind the bar mm -hmm. in snow mass. Yeah, um, and also just slaughtering everybody. So anyway, I, I that's. You know, those were the things that I looked at. I'm like, man, these guys are incredible. I, I remember I used to show friends of mine when they'd come over to my house, like, hey, you got to watch this. And yeah. we would watch like Doc Eason's 20 minute bar set and they wouldn't even care. I'd yeah. be like, how do you not think this is incredible? Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, th th those were the first guys that showed me that you could like stand up and do cool magic. Yeah. But um, I didn't really... The, the, yeah, those are those are the main inspirations. I have more since then as well, you mm -hmm. know, but uh, that's where it all started. You know, it's it's interesting how like those, especially si like hearing you say like Doc Eason, Bill Malone and Michael Lamar are some of your first like magic teachers through DVD that like you can kind of see where you came from with some of those stuff. Like you can see the little snippets of those people. I mean, obviously you have a voice and a point of view now, but you can still see where they are. I mean, you know, for me, I didn't, I didn't really know Copperfield. Uh, for me, it was the world's greatest magic specials that were, yeah, I never even knew those existed. Those, I remember those came out when I was like in middle school and high school and it was a huge event. Like on every Thanksgiving, you'd watch one of those. And I didn't, like I had a magic kits when I was a kid and my dad got me like a nickels to dimes and a cups and balls, but I wasn't like doing tricks ever. I, I don't even think I knew like layman card tricks. I don't think I learned the 21 card trick until I got seriously into magic and like read it in the David Blaine mysterious stranger book. And you're like, why would anybody do this? Yeah. <laughs> but when, you know, I was, I was a juggler very early on. And right, I, right. I got this gig at this theater called the comedy barn in pigeon forge. And they had a little pit shop down in the end of the lobby. And the juggler, the owner was like, you're a juggler. You probably know magic. Go sell magic in our magic shop. But I didn't, you know, I knew cups and balls and I knew a Svengali deck, but I didn't really know pitch routines. And there was a ventriloquist behind the counter named Stephen Knowles who taught me like how to pitch and how to, how to sell those tricks. So I sort of became like a professional magician, like the same day I became a magician. And the, first thing that happened was when I got sort of this, like when I understood that I could, I could really astonish people with this. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to look up magic to learn. This is like the early days of penguin. So the, the oh, yeah, yeah. my first, like I, like I vividly remember the first thing I ever learned, like one of the first card tricks was, uh, it wasn't even a card trick. It was a flourish. It was the long distance spinner by O's Perlman. Mm. And then I think I learned a uh, oh, quick trick was the next one, which I recently uh. reshot. Uh, <laughs> so like O's Perlman was like a really early influence on me. And then I remembered back to those, those, uh, those world's greatest magics. And that's how I got so focused on Leonard Green. Cause I remember Leonard Green's was so much different and L and L had right. the, the green magic DVDs. And so I was able to like track those down. So like those were like the green magic DVDs were some of like my first magic DVDs. 
which is like none of that is easy. Like I don't know no, what the but heck you don't wrong know that me. like when no. you when you get in right you don't you don't know what you're you don't know what the end goal is with any yeah. of it you don't care it's all new so it's exciting yeah but I think that like the early days too were like having Stephen Knowles and then a magician named Tom Vorjahan who I'm still friends with uh, and Steve Bargatze I got to work with Steve like I learned the top change from Steve Bargatze uh, and was mm-hmm. like carrying his props on and off stage and so I had this like very real like magic teachers who were like good magicians who knew like the history and were able to point you to point me towards books and stuff. And it was, it was so, I mean, I think that the reason I got, you know, capable quickly, not good, but capable as a magician was because I had older magicians who were telling me and uh, like, do this, don't do that. Showing me things, challenging me things and like, and saying, Hey, you're not doing this right. Um, Mm. uh, which was, which was, it was just wild because for them, it just, that stuff just existed. Uh, and and it was, it was normal for them to pass on that knowledge and not have to learn it from a DVD, like sort of alone Mm. and by yourself. I guess, you know, thinking about those DVDs, they are uh, compared to now a much better, uh, mentorship, (laughs) than video is now um think about some of the things that were on there we're Mm. talking like monologues to the camera yeah about how to dress for an event or how to treat the wait staff at your restaurant gig or how to ask for more money like there's real wisdom in all of those dvds like i think about those film shoots they must have been like, like the preparation for those shoots had to have been Pretty, pretty big, you know, yeah. and it's not like they're teaching you one trick. They're teaching you 20. Yeah. So if you watch all of it. You really get the full breadth of knowledge of Doc or Bill or, mm-hmm. you know, Michael a little, a little different side, but because he was he's like teaching like everybody's tricks. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, when you're really diving into like, like what didn't Doc Eason teach on his bar magic series? Like everything from every joke to every, you know, like the bad tricks to the good tricks, yeah. you know, like all of it, it's all there, you know? So really like, how do you not, if you, if you ingest a, like if you really watch it, you, mm-hmm. you, you learn everything he's got to know, you know, at least at that point in time, you know, you know, that makes me wonder like how, you know, you and I have, we're, we're in this interesting position where we teach a lot of magic now but we also learn so much from these DVDs. And I'm wondering if it's, is it just what we're doing in this podcast is learning, like remembering some of this stuff and passing it on in a different way? Or is that something we should maybe start to focus on as we put together projects? Like how do you, how do you pass on that kind of knowledge? You can't and people, I mean, unfortunately, like it's, it's not the, it's not the Penguin Magic product, right? Or it's yeah. not even like the Magic Marketplace product at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, it's honestly, it's just not what the market wants. Yeah. Strangely. Yeah. It just isn't. I mean, in the day, nobody knew what they wanted. Everybody's just excited to have magic on video. Yeah, that know, is right? true. So, um, but when you, when you, when you're dealing with like the big numbers, uh, mm-hmm. people want well taught to the point short, like, bam, like, yeah. Give me everything I need to need know so I can so I can do it, go do it. You know, the lecture format became the original, you know, L and L format or mm-hmm. whatever Stevens Magic format uh, from before. So, yeah, uh, it's I don't know. We are. I do believe we are in a, 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 a like a moment of like we're waiting for the next kind of medium to yeah. arrive. Yeah. For magic, uh, I think, and we've we've played out all of the avenues at this moment because everybody's so such a strange marketplace. Every it's got to be new, 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 new all the time, and we're just we're way ahead of it at the moment. We're waiting, waiting for something. Uh, what's next? You know, yeah. um, whether it's uh, well. I can't imagine it's like VR or whatever, but it's, uh, yeah. It's gonna so, or, or maybe it goes back to the clubs, you know, yeah. or, or something like that. Uh, I, I have no idea, but something, something is going to change soon. It's going to be interesting. Well, uh, I, you know, I think that's, 
it's pretty good for us this week. Maybe a little short, but uh, we'll uh, sure. What do you want? Five minutes on Shakespeare? <laughs> or, like, I, <laughs> no, I you I know I think this has been good. This has been interesting, um, and I think that we'll maybe. maybe Did you buy any magic lately? Lately, oh, uh, I have bought very expensive things. Um, you know, oh, I've, that's right. I got a thermal printer and uh, right. Uh, no, I'm actually I'm going back to like uh, books and like diving in and going, oh, like Marlowe had some killer stuff. Like, let's go back and look at this, or like I'm actually I'm re going through Card College again and looking for some stuff in there. I've heard of that guy. I I've been. Um, what have you? Yeah. Uh, like well they can't see it but like i've been like oh you, on ebay building puzzles oh uh, some mentalism puzzle stuff yeah mentalism puzzle stuff i i've been down the, the bob cassidy rabbit hole as usual Oof. that guy that guy was ahead of his time yeah um and uh yeah you probably can't smell it so i'll put, put it down there let's see look at look at there's a oh this there's a giant giant puzzle down there a bunch of puzzles yeah. man yeah, I got that's the whole show. I'm getting ready for this weekend. Oh, but you got shows this weekend again, huh? Just one. Mm-hmm. Just one. Oh, just okay. on su- Saturday. Saturday. Just on Saturday. Okay. You know, yeah. I I've, I've been working on um new stuff for the restaurant. That's the other that's the other thing that I'm doing right now is that I'm I'm really loving doing tableside magic and I'm trying to get myself out of playing the hits. And, uh, but even though I'm playing the hits, I'm learning stuff about it. You know, I've done my coins across routine for 15 years now, and there's new things that I'm learning in how to make it play. Like there's some simple things of like the way I turn the coins over before I do a Benzeus friction pass that sort of like reinforces the idea that the coins are solid and there's not like shells or anything like that. And some of the more visual moments are becoming really like they're getting bigger reactions because I'm, I'm able to focus on it and do it over and over and over again. And now yeah. learning how to take a trick and insert it into some of the new stuff. Like I'm doing Dan Garrett's Pendemonium, uh, which is a product that I'm working on for Penguin, but also I'm like enjoying the trick itself, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, great old trick. It's a fantastic. Yeah. If you've never seen it, it's a linking safety pin trick. And uh, yeah, we're, we're real excited to work on that project again, but putting it in the context of the restaurant has been really fun. Somebody posted on dragon scale asking if uh, they should table hop with dragon scale. And it's like, yes, yeah. y- you should. Um, not because it's like, I think the table hoppers dream or anything like that, but like the question is, I, I see these types of things all the time. Like, can I, Table hop with dragon skill. Well, yes, uh, we we know it works, and we know you can bounce around with it. But think of the knowledge you will gain, just like you're gaining on your yeah. your coins across on dragon scale, and the comfort level that yeah. you will gain. Now, maybe it isn't for you, and that's also great knowledge because then you won't have to ask if it's something you should go do. So, yes, uh, d- definitely um, yeah. do it. You know, I was thinking, you know, maybe maybe the the listeners can um maybe you put up a poll or something yeah. of like the next trick that you need to do at your restaurant gig yeah and then like at your gig you can say to your audience like oh yeah so you might not know this but i have a podcast and on that mm-hmm. podcast uh, my list we talk about magic and my mm-hmm. listeners every week get to choose what trick i do here at the table <laughs> so this week is uh all right, I'll I'll stand up to that challenge. Uh, That's pretty funny. All right, so the listener the listeners need to report in this week. You can you can flood flood the Instagram at Eric Tate at E R I K T A I T. The what trick I have to do at my restaurant gig? It next has week. to be a good trick, though. Yeah, you know? yeah. Don't be don't be telling me to do hippity hop rabbits or uh, run rabbit right. run like. No, no, no. Something something good. I mean, something marketed. Like yeah. you know something that like maybe you bought and then you know, threw it in your drawer or something, even though you want to do it still something like that. Yeah. And like, and, and, you know, keep in mind, like, you know, it's a restaurant gig, so I'm not going to be doing on edge at every table. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Although that would be kind of funny. That would be wild. Yeah. That would be, that would be wild. I still need to, I have a good idea for on edge to film, but I gotta, I gotta do it. I gotta just do it. It's uh, same. It's uh, it's definitely, it's burning a hole in my back pocket, but. uh, Mm. And what cards do you make it out of? 
Oh, I mean, you know, I, I regular re ones. I, I don't know. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I, I do have the Ninja Turtle cards, so maybe I'll make it out of yeah. those. I got to. Oh, man. I got I got I I found some of my old Ninja Turtle toys the other day, mm. which also makes me wonder, you know, I'm doing Craig Petty's chop and I produce a cat at the end of it. And now I'm starting to wonder like childhood toys is final loads for chop cup. And, and like, where could that lead you down? Who knows? Well, you gotta be able to put. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We've gone. We've jumped the shark here. We, we have. Yeah. All right, Nick, I'll see you next week. I'm going to kick over to myself <laughs> and, uh, and the magical Om Nanji. Thanks so much to Nick for joining me on the show. On to the main event. Om Darji, also known as Magical Om, is a thrilling young performer based in Los Angeles, California. They are a voice actor, comedian, and magician who's on the bleeding edge of magical performances. They're also a Magic Castle Juniors program member. With outstanding chops and a quirky sense of humor and mind-boggling vocal range, their performances are always memorable. You've actually probably already seen Ohm before, as they were featured in Ryland Petty's run on America's Got Talent. Real quick, uh, while Nick and I were talking, I mispronounced Ohm's last name. It is not Ohm Nanji, it is Ohm Darji. I sincerely apologize for the oversight, I did not have my notes in front of me. With all that being said, I caught up with Ohm Darji via Zoom, and now you get to join our conversation. Om Darji, thanks so much for joining me here on the Penguin Magic Podcast. I am very excited to have you because you and I met at Blackpool when uh, I was sitting with Kyle Purnell and you sat down and I said, dazzle me. And you proceeded to do the most aggressive and technically difficult card trick I've ever seen. Uh, would you like me to elaborate on that, Eric? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I think I think it, it you should. Would you like me to keep it PG? Yes, please. I am but 17 years of age. Yes, yes, please. Well, this is an original creation called the Riffle Trick. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's what I do when I have either a magician or a layperson, um, and they give me a deck of cards or I ask to borrow theirs because it's just stronger. Uh, it's a really fun thing. So I'm explaining, oh, this is a Wind Up Rising card deck. It's mm -hmm. Scaff. Here, let me show you. And I show that... Um, a card will jump out, but there's not enough energy in it. So I wind it up, it shoots out a bit farther, wind it up more, it shoots extra far. And then I decide to use it for a sandwich trick, the world's greatest sandwich trick. So we put two cards down on the table, a card is selected, and with just a riffle, it shoots out of the deck and in between the two sandwich cards. There's one caveat. Uh, at least the time when I did it with Eric, <laughs> it was the wrong one. Yeah. And sometimes I get a little bit upset when I'm performing. I uh, just have that Eric was had given me a very expensive deck of cards that looked very normal. So I decided to throw it in his face, his drink, and uh, generally all over the floor. And then magically the card changes in between the sandwich anyways. It was a great trick. And I think what what really sort of struck me about it was not that... Not just that it was like a really good trick, but that there was a lot of like passion, personality, and uh, risk taking involved in it that you just generally don't see when, when like when you when you ask somebody to do a trick for you, which was really interesting. Has your magic always been sort of like around this kind of like? I mean, risky is not the right way to say it, but like risque. I wouldn't even say risque. I would just say that like it's, and I'm, I'm like trying to like sort of uh, crystallize this in the moment, but uh, you are willing to walk off the beaten path pretty far for a laugh or a magical moment. Is well, that, I'll elaborate on this and yeah. I'll throw out a few of my ideas and you're welcome to use them <laughs> to um, anyone listening there at home. Well, I'm 17. I'm a member of the um, Academy of Magical Arts Junior Society, the Magic Castle. Yeah. I got in when I was 13, but I've been doing magic since I was like 10 and a half, 11. I moved into a new house and I didn't even know how to shuffle, but I found my dad's old copy of Mark Wilson's Complete Course. Mm -hmm. And I read that cover to cover and I started having weird, crazy ideas. And I was on like the normal like move monkey path card magician thing. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting older with it, and um, I realized my passion for other things outside of magic. I'm naturally gifted as a performer. I love, uh, I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. um, I consider myself a bit of an improv comic. 
I am a voiceover actor. Mm -hmm. um, in many instances, you might hear of. Hi, welcome back to the Penguin Modcast. I'm uh, Eric Tate. But I decided to kind of mix those into one because I found a lot of those things get the same reactions on their own as magic mm -hmm. in that sense of wonder uh, and that sense of beauty. And mm -hmm. I found magic was the sort of, especially talking to other magicians after COVID, especially with adults, it's just, it's not as diverse as it could be. And that's one of the symptoms of it. But there's this bigger problem of, I have a card, a deck of cards mm -hmm. and coins, and I'm going to do magic with them. Mm -hmm. And these are cool things, but they don't make sense. And so many people try to be like, oh, the jacks are the detectives yeah. trying to rationalize it and ground it. I just thought about leaning into the wildness of it. Yeah, I think. I th Why? I, I haven't lived an exactly normal life. <laughs> and I, I feel like embracing that. Yeah. That's what I like to do in my magic is I think the priority should be to entertain first second mm -hmm. i think that what you said right there on the idea of leaning into the absurd leaning into the fact that what we're doing is not normal is really important uh i mean as we're talking i just got back from my restaurant gig and like i, I mean i had so many experiences today where people were like like is this just like what you do all the time and it's like yeah this is like you know sort of semi-explaining tricks in an effort to divert someone towards the wrong path uh, so that I can then surprise them is more effective than trying to come up with some contrived situation. Just embracing the fact that what we're doing is pretty insane. Uh, and you've just taken it a little bit of a step further, which is really nice. Oh, thanks. I try not to frame as much as I can, mm -hmm. unless I'm in a specific, like I'm working at the Magic Castle doing my close-up show, mm -hmm. or I'm working at my restaurant. I try to avoid as much as possible framing things as a magic trick because mm -hmm. it avoids the challenge aspect. Yeah. And you get something greater. I found the best that the reason I still love magic so much mm -hmm. is because magical means don't necessarily need to make a magic trick. Yeah. Oh, one piece I'm working on right now. Well, maybe I should give them a, a more defined example. <laughs> yeah. Recently, uh, this past November, I did, I wrote, I, I was sitting on a bunch of, old stage material that I'd written up. Mm -hmm. So I cleaned it up, made sure it was family friendly, pitched it to my school, went through a bunch of bureaucracy and basically was allowed to direct, star in that, produce it, cast it. It was a play disguised as a magic show. I call it Magic Jamboree. You can find it on YouTube. It's wonderful. It's a comedy magic show. But what I really loved is after the first 10 minutes where I established, hey, I can do magic. Mm -hmm. I stopped presenting things. The magical element wasn't the magic trick. Mm -hmm. um, a great example is a piece from the middle. It's Chad Long's um, spaghetti gypsy thread thing. I love that. And when we're I off pod, I have an insane uh, spaghetti box to show you uh, that I. Recently, oh yes, you do. Yeah, that I recently <laughs> finished. Uh, that I've I've designed, three D printed, and had a custom piece of steel uh, made. Our listeners don't need to know about that, but uh, sorry, but please continue with your story. So um, the effect, I was thinking about this. I just seen Copperfield show in Vegas when I wrote up the premise and it was great. And I was just thinking that felt like a magic show. Mm -hmm. I do not want my shows to feel like a magic show. Mm -hmm. um, I've When I hear people after my show at the Magic Castle or even performing in real life, there's three adjectives that I love hearing that really sum it up. First, um, there's a sentence. I think it was Ollie Mealing who said it when I was showing him stuff at Blackpool. It was, I don't know what the F just happened. Mm -hmm. But that was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life, and I want more of it. Mm -hmm. And then the adjectives were, people have found this is weird and funny, mm -hmm. entertaining, and it's just slightly scary. It's walking that line of this is a little bit like one and a half of what a person should be. Mm -hmm. And in terms of magic, I like challenging what a person can be. So getting back to the effect yeah. that illustrates my point of not framing things as magic. And throughout the show, we have a dynamic. I verbally abuse and my assistant. So I've fired them and I have new assistants. Well, mm -hmm. they quit. I lying i said they fired them and so this is all playing out during the show this tension between me and my two assistants off stage so i'm about to do this effect 
and basically an old radio cooking show I had it recorded and stuff goes off and it's how to cook spaghetti so <laughs> I have my stage hand I aggressive well I have just aggressively forced them and spit on the ground and forced them to clean up a stage that I sprung cards all over mm -hmm. I bring them out and there's like a little stool and it's all pretty and there's a box of spaghetti and of course a glass of water so the first direction is get yourself some water mm -hmm. so I drink the water because I'm thirsty I'm halfway through my show mm -hmm. And then it says, bring to boil. Put it on the stove. <laughs> so I'm out of water, but I still have to cook the pasta. Yeah. So I, I'm not framing it as a magic trick. I'm just running with it. And so it's now, how is Om going to get out of this situation? It's like a cartoon mm -hmm. logic, which is, and that's how the effect yeah. goes. It's bring it to boil. Well, I pull on my nose and it sounds like a stub knob. It makes a sound effect, like a ratchet noise. So I twist it a few ways and then you hear like the burner of a stove go on yeah. and then fire shoots out of my nose. That's awesome. Like with uh, flash paper. Yeah. And then, so it's boiling. Then, okay, take out your pasta. Well, apparently my assistants gave me the wrong box because there's only one piece in it. So I have to cook this one piece of pasta. So... I break it into like eighths to try to serve more people, mm -hmm. put it in my mouth, and then the Jeopardy music plays, and I just try to cook it in my mouth. Mm -hmm. The problem is they're all like really tiny and pokey. And then out of nowhere, one of my assistants throws a bottle of glue at me because she's very angry. I was going to say a different word. <laughs> so I have to drink the glue. I chuck that to season it. Yeah. Mix it around in my mouth and pull out a whole but cooked flexible piece of spaghetti. That's fantastic. It's simply, here's a problem. Yeah. It's basic screenwriting and playwriting in my case. Here's a problem. How are we going to solve it given the set circumstance? And then what is the wildest thing possible? Mm -hmm. and the whole thing is that was a really neat experience. It's fooling for lay people. Yeah. But I'm not emphasizing this is going to be a magic trick. This is... Magician in trouble, but actually interesting. You know, I, it's as you were describing this, I was just thinking about how the magician in trouble plot is often used so incorrectly, uh, because the, I mean, the 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 basic premise the basic premise doesn't work because we we have magical powers, so therefore we can never really be in trouble. Um, it's really it's it's almost just like uh, showing how capricious you are if you're doing that. Uh, but in this situation. You're, you're a sympathetic character when you're in trouble. Um, and it's actually the other way around. I wanted to add on this. Um, I'm an actor, as I had previously mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I, this was presented in the context of a play. I love the magician in Trouble Plot, and I used it multiple times throughout the show in different mm -hmm. ways due to different forces and different outside events. Mm -hmm. It's really weird because it, the way it's used in magic. But as soon as you get out of magic, yeah. like, it makes I sense don't then. listen to too many magic podcasts or magic videos every day. I try to look at other sources. I listen to music. I watch cartoons. Yeah. I, I find more inspiration there. And the point I'm getting to is in just dramatic writing, that is the basis of character development. They encounter a problem. How are they going to overcome it? Yeah. This should tell when you do magician in trouble. That's the mistake I see a lot. It doesn't tell anyone about how you respond because mm -hmm. how you respond is your entire character. Mm -hmm. No one learns about your character in most other ways by how you res besides how you react to a stimulus. Mm -hmm. So throughout the show, I am playing a sympathetic character, but it's not a likable character. Again, it's for me, magic is about walking that boundary of mm -hmm. that's a person and a half right there. I don't know how that can exist. It's someone with, fame gone to their heads mm -hmm. who is rude to the people around them but nice to the audience it's kind of getting a peek backstage and it's revealed throughout the show that my character ultimately is just really unhappy with himself and struggles to build social connections and takes it out on other people by this point in the show it's simply when you see a problem is is the response really going to be one of a few things is it going to be are you just going to keep calm is it aggression is the aggression directed towards yourself or other people? Is it despair? 
um, it, it really depends. And throughout the show, I explore all three of those major different fields of that using my cast and my props and my tools. Because for me, that was the point of the show. It's not, I'm going to fool you. I'm going to do a great magic show. I am, but it's in Magic Jamboree. It's, and we raised um, like 1500 bucks for charity with that. Mm -hmm. It was about, you can do more as a person for other people and for yourself. You just have to push those social boundaries. Man, I, it, it took me until I was in my 30s to start to understand concepts like this. And there are magicians who I've seen who've never understood concepts like this. Um, do you think that you came to a lot of these sort of revelations about the forward action of a character and how something needs to be dramatically driven because of, uh, because of your background in acting and voice acting? Or was there something else that drew you to these, I mean, fairly high-end concepts in, in show writing? Because these aren't these aren't concepts you see in most magic shows. Most magicians are very concerned with like, uh, you know, what trick do I do here? What do I, trick do I do here? How do I make the trick at the end the biggest thing? They're not concerned about the dramatic uh, character arc, which is, I mean, you know, I, I just listened to a graduate level course on it from a seventeen year old, so I, I'm, I'm very scared to see where you go when you're older and more experienced. So, um, yeah, it's rather interesting. So I've watched some, like, like on YouTube, you can write screenwriting, or watch screenwriting courses. I'll just do it because, you know, within 10 minute video, I'll find a line that I like or like a specific approach to a situation that inspires me to think differently. But for me, that came from within. It's just growing a little bit older every day, reading different things. Uh, exposing yourself to genres that you don't really like and uh, reading books a lot, just studying film, books, plays, literature. When I write a magic trick, I write it as a play that happens to have magic in it. And it often starts out with a premise. And if it doesn't, there's a trick. And the premise is, what is the most absurd thing I could use this trick to justify? Like the Carbonara effect. Mm -hmm. The Carbonara effect is a Carbonara the spaghetti carbonara effect. No, the carbonaro effect, like in the show, is yeah. where Michael Carbonaro is in an ordinary situation doing something extraordinary, but not presenting it as magic and giving these often absurd explanations. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm thinking almost the opposite. How can I make this the most ridiculous? If I'm doing the coin bend, mm -hmm. do I have magic powers? Am I gifting someone magic powers? No, I did a stint in juvie because I got angry and ran over a kid. But I learned anger, ma anger management mindfulness techniques. So I'm going to put this coin in your hand and you'll do a body scan. By the way, um, the reason I got out is due to trauma because my roommate got shanked. Well, my cellmate got shanked, um, Jimmy. <laughs> and so they, it's like the most ordinary looking like plain white man yeah. lifting the, holding the coin. And so I, I just read out, well, it's actually my court papers, but mm -hmm. I, uh, on the other side is written a body scan meditation. Mm-hmm. And then, all right, open your eyes, take a deep breath, open your hand, and it's bent. Yeah. And we all just stare at that. The implication, and I say it, you're the guy who shanked my cellmate. <laughs> right? It makes it funny and engaging outside of the magic. The magic yeah. is a device. Yeah. It's just to tell the stories you want to tell. Sometimes it's, here's the coin bent. I need an idea for it. Mm -hmm. Other times, it's something I did in my show, Magic Jamboree, which I'll keep plugging because it only has like 100 views on YouTube. That's it's right. where- um, People can see this, correct? Yes, it's on YouTube. It's free. It's hour and like 10 minutes. There's like a live ban at the end. There will be a link in the show description so that people oh, listening to this can go kind. see it. No, of course, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, in that show, it started off from a premise, which was- I was reading a Bob Farmer trick in Scripting Magic by Pete McCabe. Fantastic set of books. Wonderful guy. Um, really influential. I was reading it, and there was a trick from Bob Farmer, which was he sold his soul to the devil just to do, like, this one card trick. And I thought, you know what would be really interesting? Because that's, like, overdone. What if I didn't sell my soul to the devil? What if he just owes me, like, a couple bucks. <laughs> and how would that happen? Like, he owes me 20 bucks. Yeah. Does he owe me a meal? Does he owe me a tip? And I work at a restaurant. I, 
like work table side. Mm -hmm. So I ended up doing it in the show. It evolved over the course of a few drafts and a few months. I sized up the props to stage. I used the square circle. So the premise, it's like a five minute piece. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to basically go over it. It makes fun of like the David Copperfield schlocky sort of, I don't really understand what's happening, but it's magic, right? So it's interesting. And we paid to see this. So watch it, kids. It's, there's a can and it's a tip jar, Mm -hmm. like a couple nesting, like old rusty cans. And I have like a Morgan dollar that I make appear and I drop it in and there's nothing. And I keep dropping it. It just falls through it because there's no bottom. So I show them empty and you can see all the way through them. And then I have an idea. It's done to like classical music and it looks all fancy. Ooh, I put my handkerchief in it. Whoa, seven handkerchiefs appear. But when I put a coin in, nothing. Yeah. I just want money. I just want tips. Mm-hmm. And then I put in a feather that ended up in my pocket. Mm-hmm. You know what that means? I reach in and a live dove appears out of the can. I show it to the audience. All the kids love it. And then BAM! I smash it to the ground and stomp it <laughs> under my feet. A feet like amazing Jonathan. And the kids love that, by the way. They're not traumatized at all. (laughs) I think that kids can tell it's a rubber dove. And I I think they can understand the the humor in it. By the time it gets smashed. Before I have some techniques called um, palming a few extra feathers and dropping them (laughs) so it looks very real. But uh, it gets smashed. Because it's funny, because when you do that, all the women in the audience, when you produce an animal, and all the kids are like, oh, and then it's like, oh. And I jump about five feet in the air. It's a great bit. I had to practice that jump. But anyway, I get to that. There's still no money. Mm-hmm. And I'm just annoyed. So I cut the music. And I just scream down into the ground. Mm-hmm. Satan, baby, come on. We agree. You owe me one. Yeah. And then like the apple marimba tone goes. <laughs> and we project the call on yeah. the whole theater. So you just hear me having like a minute long conversation with Satan and it's indirectly revealed. Oh, I was working. Satan saw me perform. He loved it, but he didn't have, um, you didn't have any money on him for a tip, but you know, he's not a douche. He's Satan, the Lord of darkness, but he supports the performing arts. So he said, I'll help you out with mon- one magic trick. Um, yeah. We hang up and you know, there's smoke and stuff and then money appears. I love it. But it's that premise of, I know Satan. Yeah. And then people like the next day, like, are just, obviously you didn't meet Satan, but who was that? The the sort of, like, absurd nature of what you're going into uh, doesn't necessarily detract from the magic because it sounds like you're able to pull back the comedy and let the magic breathe on its own. And then... But they, but by going so absurd, it makes it very memorable, and maybe it enhances yeah. the magic a bit. Like, have you ever? I mean, there's think a trick. Why do people always do it with milk? It's one of mm-hmm. my favorite effects out there. Uh, and unless you're doing, oh, I'm Steve Cohen, the gentleman's magician for the bourgeoisie, then it's milk. Yeah. I'm Lance Burton, and I saw Lance Burton do it, so I'm going to do it with milk because yeah. I only know Jim Steinmeier's version. Yeah, and. I saw that and I thought, where does milk come from? Mm-hmm. A cow. And then I thought of an old joke. If white milk comes from a white cow, yeah. where does chocolate milk come from? A brown, a brown cow. cow. Then I thought, what if I actually have a cow on stage dispensing the milk? The effect is not... You name a drink and it appears. The effect is, you name. I have a psychic cow that has to be quote unquote off stage throughout the entire show, except for his tail, her tail. Her name's Bessie, the psychic cow, because of uh, tax deductible yeah. state of California regulations. So she's making the milk appear or the selected drinks, but it's distinctly her doing it. That's oh, it's, I love the idea of that. That's my closer. It's well, and then it's, it's a closer, great. and then I have a band come and play. Oh, Susanna! <laughs> it's fantastic. I love the idea of just like people being able to call any drink from a cow. Uh, it's it's really clever. I want to shift topics a little bit because you mentioned that yes. you're a part of the Magic Castle Junior program. Um, I feel like this is a very storied. Uh, 
it's a very storied group because there are many people like, you know, Chris and Lambert and Trig Watson and uh, Kyle Ash and countless others who have come through this and are now, you know, very firmly entrenched in the history of magic. How did you join it? And what is the experience being in there? And granted, you don't speak for all of the juniors, I think, so you're only able to talk about your experience. Well, I will share. Um, first of all, it's really funny that you mentioned it, like all these famous names, because mm -hmm. it's really weird, because like the episode that came out right before I came to record this was, I think, Matt Franco. Yes. And then um, Christian Grace, and it's like, little old Ohm. <laughs> is on the Penguin Magic podcast. So thank you for this opportunity. Oh, no, but, not a problem. Go ahead. Well, I mean, like, look, I like to interview people who I think are talented and interesting. And I think you are both talented and interesting. As I've gotten to know you more, uh, there's no reason that you shouldn't be on this podcast. But uh, I also a little bit understand the feeling of, oh, little old me, when you're being put next to other names because that happens to me frequently these days and I still don't consider myself <laughs> anything of note. Uh, I feel, still think of myself as the guy in the corner who's shuffling cards who wishes he could be a part of the party because uh, I'm more introverted than people realize. But uh, but sorry, continue along your uh, about your your journey into the, the junior program and what sort of what goes on there. Cause I don't, I don't think many, I think many magicians know that there's a junior program, but they don't really understand what goes on in it. Yeah. So I'll explain how I heard about it and then what goes on and then what I've learned from it mm -hmm. because it goes from 13 to 21. So I've got a few years left in me there. Yeah. Uh, but here's basically what, you know, what happened with me. So my dad tells me, Hey, Ohm, there's this place called the Magic Castle, and apparently they have a junior program. So we went. It was really fun. And you have to be 13. I kid you not. The audition day was the day before my 13th birthday, <laughs> March 24th, same day as Houdini. Um, but I studied over the summer. I picked an effect cannibal carts. Mm -hmm. I came up with a premise, and then that September I went audition got in on my first edition and you'll never guess what got me through um the judging board it was quite something it, the magic the quality of the slights was there mm -hmm. but it was because of a stupid joke I made at Jabrizi <laughs> that I just made up in the moment I don't even remember what it was I basically had oh name a famous magician for each one mm -hmm. um for each court card and then they'll vanish and someone picked Jabrizi, so I just clowned on him for the rest of my five-minute audition, which was really fun. I can see how playing that kind of inside baseball with the judges would have really endeared you to them. But um, after that audition, we I had like two meetings and then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. But even through COVID, we continued with what the junior program does. It's not, it doesn't teach you things. It's a mentorship program. Mm -hmm. You have access to the AMA library, which is a huge treasure trove of obscure effects and popular things. It's a great source of information. Mm -hmm. You also have access to plenty of people on the board. Um, we've had Shudo Gawa has been on the board, Robert Ramirez, Pete McCabe is on the board right now. Uh, and you can just pick their brains. You have their contact. They're there at the meetings. They have local and non-resident members. And you get to just ask them questions. You get to hang out with a bunch of like-minded people who are creative, mm -hmm. the new force of magic. And my favorite thing as a queer person of color has been the fact that it is exclusively a younger demographic. Mm -hmm. It's so much more diverse than like any IBM meeting yeah. that I've ever been to. I mean, it's regional, yeah. but because it's just young people, it's just, it's so much more divor divorce. Hmm. One in one and two families. Yes. Uh one in three marriages and divorce. <laughs> but it's so much more diverse. And yeah. there's because of that, there's just new perspectives at looking at things, different ways of shopping around ideas. Yeah. I have I've made really close friends through there. Amanda Nepo, who is on Fool Us, she's released some stuff with Penguin. Yeah. We hang out, we um spitball ideas. I'm not gonna give away too many of them. Yeah. One fantastic trick that we came up with that I am working on is the finding Osama trick. <laughs> where you're given five, six images of, I pull out an envelope mm -hmm. 
and there's a prediction that I write down and you're given a random spectator is given six different images mm -hmm. uh, and you, you show that they have different Arab men on them and they're placed down. They're all same on the back. They're like the size of like, I don't know, four by three size images, bigger than a playing card. And okay, so it's not equivocate exactly. Different spectators select ones. You see each one, you eliminate their like stock images. Mm -hmm. And the last one that they select is Osama bin Laden. Okay. And I get to say, congratulations, you found Osama bin Laden. And I say, oh, check the prediction. And they do. And it says, you'll find Osama bin Laden on your last try. And they say, oh, you mm. see the little zipper on that wallet? Yeah. Open that up. And they reach inside. And there's a little card in there. And it says, Osama bin Laden knows you live at, at its, their address, or at least their city of residence. Oh, that is wild. Don't open your mail for the next few days. That is that is wildly terrifying, and I love it. But yeah, I love walking that line of. It's just slightly scary in an yeah. intriguing way, in a delicious way. It's almost like a, like a like a sweet but slightly spicy pastry. It's yeah. I love this, but there's a little bit of edge that makes it makes me want more. And it feels like, you know, there's a certain irreverence required that to do something like that where I mean I, I you know not every listener to this show is going to be like in love with that effect the way I am uh but there is a certain there will be people why can't you do the hundredth <laughs> A-can yeah but, back in my day we had A-can yeah. and more than dollars why can't you just vanish one of those but there's there's something about the irreverence of youth that can get you to like the whole finding Osama thing, whether or not you like that gets you to this impossible moment of their own address being revealed. And obviously I don't know how it works or anything like that, but like having your own address revealed to you in the context of a magic trick is an incredibly powerful idea and using the, all of the left turns around like this sort of very irreverent presentation about we're going to try and find Osama bin Laden is really fun because it's going to catch you so off guard when your own address and it's comedic it. punchlines it's set yeah. up in punchline and it's yeah. also Chekhov's gun and you're setting something up and then resolving it yeah it's i'm not saying we're going to find osama i'm mm -hmm. saying we're going to try a little experiment the bush administration did in the year about uh in the early 2000s we won't <laughs> talk about when that depends on the perspective but um Here's my wallet. No, let me write something down. Mm -hmm. Lovely meeting you. I need to know a few details about you, your personality, stuff mm -hmm. like that, habits. Great. All right. That will determine my prediction. Done. Here I have the image of six Arab men. Mm -hmm. And then it yeah. goes, finding Osama yeah. is completely, you feel like something terrorist is coming, but you don't know what. Yeah. You. That's the first, okay, boom. That's hilarious. And then by the time, and that's completely unexpected. And then by the time it wears off, oh, I could see how that was set up, blah, blah, blah. And then he knows where you live. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's almost too real, but it's not too yeah. real. Yeah. It's, it's that perfect line of, okay, I know I'm not actually in danger, but yeah, this is, it this is weird in a good way. It reminds me of a trick that Spidey did in his lecture where he, he really wanted to do a Ouija presentation, but he, oh, yeah. but he also, he, um, I heard Luigi. Oh no. Uh, Ouija, not Luigi. Ouija. Let's like, but Ouija, imagine Ouija you board. use one of those to summon Luigi. <laughs> you can use that. Anyone who's using this podcast, like you have a, a Luigi <laughs> finger puppet that appears out of a box or something like a cat's paw or one of those. Everyone should do the, the summoning Luigi thing. No, what, like where, you would have a hole in the Ouija, the Ouija board yeah. and then just like, okay, you, you spell Luigi and then just like out of the hole, it just pops out Luigi and you can have like a <laughs> fake hand gimmick. Like it's the size of your hand. So I, I, I have one right here on camera that I use for a, a different sort of effect, yeah. but you could just be like, look, I'm not holding it. It's kind of just a tray. Mm -hmm. And then there's just Luigi. And if you, if you can do ventriloquism, you could be like, it's me, a Luigi. And you can just talk to the audience or swear at them. Your choice. <laughs> Like I do an effect. I, I don't, I kid you not. I have a card to wallet that I hate. I hate the look of the wallet. I never do it. Yeah. I actually do it when I want to do ring to wallet because I borrow someone's ring, ask how much it was and then throw it into the street. Yeah. 
And then, oh, I'll pay you back. And then it's in my zippered compartment, yeah. which is played for shock. But the reason I actually still keep that wallet is it functions like a puppet. So <laughs> I think I showed Eric this at Blackpool. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to talk about what it says on the podcast, but it is the rudest thing you will ever hear. It only speaks in expletives. So I just, it has, it has like a completely, my natural voice is here. Mm -hmm. um, I use subharmonic techniques. So it talks down here. So I just pull it out of my pocket. And I'm like, oh, have you met my wallet? He's really sweet. It's Wallace the wallet. Say yeah. hi. And they're like, hi. And Wallace is like. Expletive. You know, just throw slurs at people. But it's not me. Wallace can say it. It's, it's about finding that line and sitting right on it. Yeah. Uh, and there's uh, there's something that you can only do with. You can only do that in your youth and learn to experiment with where the line is uh, it's relative to where you are and who your audience is you yes. should always perform to your audience yeah. if eric did that that would look creepy as hell <laughs> i mean i have a it's duck that smokes a cigarette man going up show. to a minor sending <laughs> expletives through a wallet do you understand how magician-y that sounds yeah so what do you, what do you think is one of the best gifts that you've gotten out of being a part of the junior program Being able to perform, well, it's one of two things. Mm -hmm. I'll say both of them. One, it's being able to perform at the Magic Castle in the close-up room. Yeah. I work brunches there at least once a month, mm -hmm. and I do my 20-minute close-up show. It's a great way to experiment. It there it can be sometimes rigorous because mm -hmm. my material is a bit transgressive. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it appeals to kids, but it's really paid off because just doing it, I did either original material or material that no one's touched in years. I mm -hmm. do Dan Harlan's 20th century socks in that show, and it kills every Dan time. Dan would love that. That is, I have seen Dan do 20th century socks so many times. It's arguably one of his favorite pieces. I'm so glad that someone else is out there doing it because it's an amazing trick. Yeah, I, I do that as part of my show, but the really nice thing is I love Lego. At the end of the piece, I do a um, a Lego sort of drawing duplication, mm -hmm. which is mathematically very difficult and took me, I'm not going to talk much about it because it took me many, many, many years to figure out how to make this logistically possible. But it's really neat because talking to kids after the show is what makes that magic for me mm -hmm. and adults and their parents, because especially magicians who have been there to the castle a lot, they come and tell me that was the most interesting thing I've seen in a while. Mm -hmm. Because I visually stand out. I wear bright colors and, you know, it's not David Regal's solid purple suit. Mm -hmm. Get that out of my face. Are you the Joker or are you a Canadian? I can't tell. It's tasteful, but colorful. Mm -hmm. And I, sp I don't talk down to kids. I speak on their level mm -hmm. and I keep them engaged. And so the kids like it and find it funny. The adults like it and find it funny. And the special thing is after the show, I let the kids examine, play with the Lego that's out there if they want it. Mm -hmm. um, if they have a, if someone didn't get to participate before they leave the room, I uh, grab them for a second. I ask their parents and ask if they have a favorite cartoon character and do that voice. Do you like Mickey Mouse? Mm -hmm. Oh boy, it's Mickey Mouse. And Mickey hopes you have a great day. Bye bye. I love and that. it's just really special. Yeah, that's what I. That's probably my favorite thing that I've gotten out of the castle. Um, there's a secret door in one of the walls, and my dressing room is on the other side. So there's a little owl that you're supposed yeah. to talk to to open the door. Yeah, and sometimes I'll just talk back, and they'll be like, "Abracadabra," <laughs> and I'll be like, "Try again." I love. And that. they're like, "Mommy, mommy, the wall's talking to me." Sure, dear. It's a, a really it's really fun using my different talents to make the whole experience of being there special. Yeah. And then the other thing from the castle is just connections. Mm -hmm. um, when Rylan the Kid Magician was working America's Got Talent yeah. here in the States last season, uh, he needed young people from the castle. I was on the team of assistants and ended up doing some assistant choreography backstage. Mm -hmm. And I got to meet all the other acts. I learned different stuff from the different performers. We just chat. I, I was just chatting with one of the singers. It was a real blast. Um, and, you know, I got to make connections. There's some stuff I can't talk about because I don't know when this podcast is going to release. <laughs> but I'll be on a major TV thing very soon. Hope oh, Excellent. 
Uh, but it's it's really being able to make connections because when people, especially in the Hollywood area, mm -hmm. see when they need young people, young diverse magicians mm -hmm. or entertainers, that's where they go. Yeah. And I'm right there. I'm like, oh, this one's qualified and hits all the boxes. Well, um, I feel like I could talk to you all day, but we do have uh, to, to come to a close on this podcast. So we'll just have to have you back. Thanks so much for coming on and giving us your, oh, our, that's too your sweet. perspective and also uh, just telling us about the junior program and hearing more. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Thanks so much for joining us. All right. Perfect. That's going to do it for this week, kids. Thanks so much to Ohm for joining me on the show, and thanks to you for listening. As you are listening to this, I am packing up to head to Nashville and perform at House of Cards. I'm really looking forward to hanging out with all of the Penguin fans in Nashville and showing off all my new 3D printed toys that are in my show. As always, we're a weekly podcast, so be sure to like and subscribe, as well as share your favorite episodes on the social media platform you're sharing your 3D printed devices on. If you wanted to reach out to me about anything on this week's show, you're going to have to slip a note into my calipers case. Kids, I am so excited to take these 3D printed gadgets out on the road. I have some insane stuff designed and I am super stoked to put it into practice. But if 3D printing magic gadgets isn't your cup of tea, you can always hit me up on Instagram at Eric Tate. That's at E-R-I-K-T-A-I-T. -I -I -T. From me and everyone else here at the P3 Magic Studios, practice, practice, perform. <laughs>